there's this special feeling that you sometimes get when watching professional wrestling. It's that feeling during a match where you know you're watching something special, that you're watching something that's going to be talked about for years. It's a feeling that only comes around when you're watching the absolute best of the best in professional wrestling. And it's a feeling that I most recently got when watching Hangman Page and Kenny Omega versus the Young Bucks at AEW Revolution 2020. Everything surrounding this match, the buildup, the match itself, and the fallout was a storytelling masterpiece. The amount of attention to detail in this match is unlike anything we've seen in American pro wrestling in a very long time. This was four of the most brilliant wrestling minds today operating at the highest level from a storytelling and in-ring standpoint which allowed these men to have the entire crowd in the palm of their hands that night in Chicago, Illinois. Today we'll be taking a deep dive into this classic and what made it so special and why it won so many year-end awards for match of the year in 2020. This is Tranquilo Club and this is why Kenny Omega and Hangman Page versus the Young Bucks is a masterpiece. So just a little quick recap of how we got here. When AEW was founded, it was announced that Cody Rhodes, Kenny Omega, and the Young Bucks would all be executive vice presidents with the company. This meant that Hangman Page was left as the odd man out. But despite this, Hangman Page would go on to AEW's first show, Double or Nothing, and win the Casino Battle Royale, which earned him a spot in the match that would crown the first ever AEW World Champion at the next AEW pay-per-view, All Out. And as we know now, he would go on to lose that match against Chris Jericho. And this is where Hangman's story truly begins. After losing the title match to Chris Jericho, Hangman Page decides that he wants to do his own thing and on being the elite, he decides to step away from the group. That's right, Hangman decides to leave popular wrestling group The Elite. And as you can imagine, this came off as a huge shock to the Young Bucks and Kenny Omega. They were losing a lot of matches too, but they felt they didn't need to leave the group. They felt they were stronger as a unit together. So then Hangman would try to do his own thing for a while, but he would ultimately fall short at almost every turn. He would first lose a few matches to Pac, and then he would compete for the Dynamite Diamond Ring, where he actually made the final before falling at the final hurdle against MJF. And the Elite would take notice of Hangman's shortcomings. They would ask him constantly to rejoin them, that they could all get back to winning ways together. Despite these attempts, by the Young Bucks in particular, Hangman would shut them down at every turn. And weirdly enough, despite all the drama within the Elite, AEW President Tony Khan kept booking Hangman Page and Kenny Omega together as a tag team. But if you saw their matches together, you'd understand why Tony Khan kept booking them together. They had insane chemistry with each other. And honestly, both of them individually were going through a rough patch before they started teaming up. Here were two guys who were supposed to be two pillars for AEW but had pretty much lost every big match up to that point. So becoming a tag team helped them get back to winning ways together despite their differences. So as Hangman and Omega start winning more, they start climbing the rankings in AEW's tag team division. And meanwhile, the Young Bucks are also climbing the rankings themselves. But they've yet to win the those elusive AEW tag team titles. Which is crazy because a lot of people had primed them to be the first ever AEW tag team champions, but it wasn't going the way of the Young Bucks. This only causes more friction within the Elite because the Young Bucks and now Hangman and Omega are chasing the tag team titles, and obviously only one team is going to be able to win them. So this leads to a number one contenders match for the AEW tag team titles at Bash at the Beach. This would be a four way match between the teams of Santana in Ortiz, the best friends, and you guessed it, the Young Bucks, and Kenny Omega and Hangman Page. And this match is where things really start to heat up within the Elite. There's this really subtle moment in this match where Kenny Omega and the Young Bucks are all teaming up together, basically ganging up on one guy. And they're hitting their signature moves, they're posing together. And the camera cuts to Hangman Page on the apron and he has this look on his face where he just looks really uncomfortable. It's like he almost can't believe that these guys are doing this in front of him. So now not only only does Hangman have to worry about the Young Bucks stealing his moment, he's now questioning whether his own partner, Kenny Omega, is truly on his side or not. But somehow, Kenny Omega and Hangman pull it off and they win the match, becoming number one contenders for the AEW Tag Team titles. And after the match, they're congratulated by the Young Bucks, so it seems like everything's okay for now. 
but Hangman Page still seems pretty uncomfortable to be in this position. He clearly doesn't want to be a part of this, but he's just going along with it because he just keeps winning. So why not, right? And it's during this time that Hangman starts picking up his alcoholic persona. He starts drinking all his problems away, he's going into the crowd and taking beer from them and just chugging it down completely. But man does this get over like crazy. Hangman is coming out every week and the crowd is chanting cowboy shit and they're begging him to take their beer and drink it. And it's a snowball effect. It's incredible to see how each week Hangman is getting more over gradually over time because of this story. So the next week on the Jericho Cruise edition of AEW Dynamite, Hangman and Omega take on SCU for the tag team titles. And to the surprise of everyone, they actually win. And once again after the match, the Young Bucks come out out to congratulate Paige and Omega, but Hangman isn't having any of it. Instead of celebrating with the Young Bucks or even his own tag team partner Kenny Omega, he decides to jump into the crowd and celebrate with them while having a beer of course. The Young Bucks insist that they're happy for Hangman and Omega, but they do make it clear they will eventually have to face off for those titles because they want them too. This is where the Elite's friendship is really put to the test because the Young Bucks are now chasing the titles that their friends have and Hangman is part of a tag team that he doesn't want to be in. Meanwhile, Kenny Omega is almost playing the middleman in all of this. He insists that the Young Bucks and Hangman Page get along and that this won't cause a rift between the Elite. But some cracks within this group do start to show. The Young Bucks voice their opinion against Hangman's alcohol problem. Meanwhile, Hangman is making fun of the Young Bucks because he won the tag team titles before they did. And of course, as stated earlier, Kenny Omega finds himself in the middle of all of this. He doesn't know whose side to choose and this only pisses off both sides even more. But then it finally happens. The Young Bucks become the number one contenders for the tag team titles by winning a tag team battle royal on AEW Dynamite. And this makes it official. The Young Bucks will take on Kenny Omega and Hangman Page on pay-per-view at AEW Revolution. Tension was at an all-time high going into this match and the one with the biggest suspicions was Hangman Page. At this point, Hangman is completely fed up with the Young Bucks. He accuses them of trying to steal his one and only true moment in AEW so far. He feels he also can't trust Kenny Omega because he's spending way too much time with the Young Bucks instead of focusing on their tag team. And because of this, the intrigue for the match was raised even more. People assumed Hangman and Omega were going to implode in this match, whether it was because Hangman couldn't trust Omega anymore and he was going to turn his back on him, or because Omega was going to reunite with the Young Bucks and turn his back on Hangman. No one knew what was going to happen, and that's what made this match special. From the moment Hangman's theme hit at AEW Revolution, the crowd had already made up their minds on who they were cheering for. In a match with Kenny Omega and the Young Bucks, three of the biggest stars in AEW and reasons why the company was even possible, Hangman Page was the biggest star of this whole thing. The layers of storytelling that these four men are about to display are incredible. And props to commentary who are playing up this whole thing really well. Tony Schiavone points out that Hangman and Omega come out separately with their own themes. Meanwhile, the Young Bucks are coming out together as they have their entire careers. It's such a small subtle thing, but it adds so much to the match. The little seed of doubt that they're planting in your head is only setting you up for the emotional roller coaster you're about to go on. And like I said, Hangman is the star of this match. He's the hero of this story. Then there's the Young Bucks who come in as the villains from the get-go. The crowd despises them, they side with Hangman, they relate to Hangman. They do not like what the Young Bucks have been doing to Hangman over the past few months. And because the crowd loves Hangman so much and are rooting so hard for him, this match is elevated to a whole nother level because the crowd investment is at an all-time high. When you give the crowd someone to care about, someone so relatable, then it becomes must-see because you're rooting for them so hard. And that's what pro wrestling is. And in return, you get a recipe for an all-time classic. Then on the other side, you have the Young Bucks who are playing up the heel parts perfectly. They're trash-talking Hangman, they're spitting in his face, they're throwing middle fingers at him. It's crazy and the crowd is going absolutely wild. Then there's another interesting dynamic in this match. Kenny Omega is still trying to play the middleman in all of this. He's not trying to get personal, he's just there to defend the titles against his friends. The Young Bucks 
not so much. They're there to win the titles no matter the cost. This match kicks into high gear when Kenny Omega decides to say enough is enough and goes all out against the Young Bucks. And that's when these four wrestlers have everyone in the palm of their hands. Everyone is now going crazy for both Hangman and Omega and they want to see the Young Bucks get their comeuppance. And this only keeps escalating because once Kenny Omega decides to go all out, so do the Young Bucks. So now you have an elite civil war basically unfolding in front of our very eyes. But it's all this tension, all this drama that leads to a moment in the match that I will never forget. The Young Bucks take out Hangman Page outside of the ring with an indie taker. Hangman is out, Kenny Omega is the only one left in the ring, and the Young Bucks are looking to finish this off already. They hit Kenny with a couple of super kicks, Kenny falls to his knees, and the end seems to be near. But in a complete show of disrespect, the Young Bucks hit Kenny Omega with a golden trigger. That's right, the move that he and Kota Ibushi, the golden lovers, use as a finisher. The crowd is in shock, Kenny Omega is out cold, and the Young Bucks go for the pin. And Kenny Omega, in an act of defiance, aggressively kicks out at one. And the crowd goes absolutely crazy. This is crazy. It's one of those moments where you can't believe what you're watching. It was like Kenny's one last F you to the Young Bucks for disrespecting the Golden Lover's name. You just simply don't do that. After this, the Young Bucks try to finish it once and for all. They hit the Malter Driver on Omega, but Hangman makes the save. Omega then tries to hit the One Winged Angel on Matt Jackson, but he can't because his shoulder is way too injured at that point. Hangman tags in and hits a One Winged Angel himself to a huge pop in the arena but that's not enough either. Then at that point, Hangman says enough is enough. He hits a buckshot lariat to Nick Jackson on the outside of the ring. Then he hits one on Matt Jackson on the inside and gets the one, two, three. Hangman wins the match, the bell rings, the crowd gives all the wrestlers a standing ovation, commentary is speechless, and so am I. Omega, Hangman, and the Young Bucks had just put on an absolute classic, and everyone who was watching knew it. But even when the match was over, the story itself wasn't over. After the match was over, the Young Bucks were once again trying to make amends with Hangman and Omega. Omega forgives them, but Hangman not so much. He waits on the outside of the ring while Kenny and the Young Bucks talk it out. And it's here where we see a few subtle moments that add so much intrigue to this story. Before Hangman steps out of the ring as Omega and the Young Bucks Bucks embrace, he has his back turned to the three of them. And if you read Omega and the Bucks body language, it appears almost as if they're gonna set up a super kick on Hangman. But then Hangman turns around and the other three guys just play it cool in the end. Then Hangman steps out of the ring and now Omega has his back turned to Hangman. And Hangman puts his title down and grabs the ropes and it appears almost as if he's setting up for a buckshot lariat on Kenny Omega. But then Omega turns around and Hangman is now the one playing it cool. He holds the ropes open for Omega as he tells him to come over. The two of them finally embrace after a match for the first time in the run as a tag team. But the crowd is left wondering, did we really just see what we thought we saw? And if so, what's next for these two? The reason why this match worked so well was because it was subtle, long-term storytelling that felt real. This story was brewing since the very first day that AEW was founded, when Hangman said he wanted to be the first ever AEW World Champion. The beauty of this match isn't just the storytelling, it's the level of depth of storytelling in it. If you came into this match not knowing the story between all of these guys in the Elite, then you would have still gotten a hell of a match out of it. But this match was best enjoyed knowing the story of everyone involved, because this was the type of match that rewarded the viewer who knew their history going into this. I mean all the callbacks, all the easter eggs, it was just one of the most enjoyable matches for anyone who was a fan of storytelling. And the crazy part is, in a match that had Kenny Omega and the Young Bucks, it was Adam Page who came out of this looking like an absolute superstar. This was Hangman's story. This was his moment. This was the night he arrived. And I think AEW's booking deserves so much credit because Hangman, when he faced Jericho at All Out 2019, did not have this level of fanfare. AEW took a guy who fans were saying was being pushed too hard too soon and completely deconstructed him and made him one of the most relatable wrestlers today. 
And that's why this match is a masterpiece, because it had all the makings of a classic. It had a fantastic long-term story with a lovable babyface, a fantastic match, and a wrestler coming out looking like an absolute superstar from this match. And the subtleties of tension and betrayal that was still present after the match was over only left us guessing and wanting more. And the crazy thing is, this was really only the beginning of the Hangman Page story. As we know now, the story between Hangman and Kenny ended up being one of heartbreak. And it all started here on this February night in Chicago, Illinois. Pro wrestling does not get any better than this. So if you haven't seen this match, I urge you to go check it out. And see for yourself why the Young Bucks vs Kenny Omega and Hangman Page is a masterpiece. After Revolution, the pandemic would hit worldwide and wrestling as we knew it would never be the same. Hangman Page would be one of the many wrestlers left unable to travel due to the shutdown. We wouldn't see him until the next pay-per-view, Double or Nothing, where he would team up with the Elite to take on the Inner Circle in a Stadium Stampede match. In this match, it was alluded to that Hangman was still feeling some sort of animosity towards the Young Bucks, but he appeared to be on better terms with Kenny Omega. Despite their differences over the past few months, the Elite ends up winning the stadium stampede and hangman checks on kenny omega after the match to make sure he's okay he seems to have no problem celebrating with kenny but he seems reluctant to celebrate with the young bucks the following wednesday on dynamite cash wheeler and dax harwood as ftr make their long-awaited aew debut but it's a way that nobody expected they show up to save the young bucks from an attack from the butcher and the blade and this leads to a match a few weeks later on dynamite where ftr defeat the butcher and the blade after the match the young bucks come out to congratulate FTR and offer them a handshake, but before FTR can even respond, the Young Bucks are attacked by Butcher and FTR are attacked by The Blade and several other tag teams. It's here where Kenny Omega and Hangman Page come out to save the Young Bucks and FTR. All three teams clean house and stand tall, but there appears to be tension between FTR and Hangman and Omega. I mean, after all, Hangman and Omega are AEW tag team champions. After this, it was announced that at Fighter Fest, there would be an eight-man tag team match where the Young Bucks and FTR would team up to take on the Butcher and the Blade and the Lucha Bros. Meanwhile, Hangman and Omega defended their AEW tag team titles against Best Friends, a match where they came up victorious. After the match, FTR come out to congratulate Hangman and Omega with a couple of beers. Of course, Hangman gladly takes the beer from FTR, but Kenny Omega, who doesn't drink, chooses to pour out his beer in front of FTR to their disgust. And before things get out of control, the Young Bucks come out to separate FTR from Kenny Omega. But it's here where we get an interesting visual where the Young Bucks are standing with Omega and Hangman is standing with FTR. Because in his mind, FTR didn't do anything wrong. They were just a couple of guys offering some beers. The following week on Fighter Fest Night 2, FTR and the Young Bucks end up losing their 8-man tag team match to The Butcher and the Blade and the Lucha Bros. But there seems to be no hard feelings as FTR and the Bucks shake hands after the match. The following week at Fight for the Fallen, the Young Bucks and Kenny Omega come out after FTR's victory over the Lucha Bros. And it's here where Kenny Omega is looking to make amends with FTR. As he comes out with a couple of beers and proposes a toast, FTR, who are clearly still pissed about what happened a couple of weeks ago, decide to pour their beer all over Kenny Omega. And this obviously sends Omega into a fit of rage, but the Young Bucks hold him back before he can get to FTR. This does something to Kenny Omega, as later in the night, there's a six-man tag where he's teaming up with the Young Bucks to take on the Jurassic Express. The Elite end up getting the win, but after the match, it appears that Kenny Omega has lost it as he attacks Marco stunt to the point where Nick Jackson has to pull him back. It's here where Excalibur points out how earlier in the night FTR poured beer all over Kenny Omega, but Hangman Page is having a beer with FTR during this six-man tag team match. Later on being the elite, Kenny Omega confronts Hangman Adam Page and asks him why he was hanging out with FTR after what they did to him. Hangman responds by telling Kenny that he kinda had it coming for pouring out the beer in front of them. Hangman plays it off as no big deal and assures Omega that FTR are good guys. He then asks 
Omega, if he's cool, to which Omega says, yeah, I'm cool. It's only national TV, right? As he walks away, visibly frustrated. Over the next several weeks, FTR and Hangman's relationship begins to grow. They're spending more time together. Hangman is inviting them out to have a beer. Hangman is there to celebrate with FTR when they finally sign their AEW contracts. Meanwhile, FTR save Hangman from a beatdown by the Dark Order before even Kenny can come out. For the first time in a long time, Hangman Adam Page is happy. He finally has friends who understand him and who he can relate to, two Carolina boys who just like to drink. As time goes on, Kenny Omega actually becomes more accepting of FTR because he trusts his partner Hangman Adam Page. And this all leads to a big 12-man tag team match on Dynamite where FTR team up with the Young Bucks and Hangman and Omega to take on the Dark Order. During the match, Dax Harwood gets an injury and Hangman walks him to the back, seemingly abandoning the match. But to everyone's surprise, Hangman does come back to the match to help out the elite but since they still are outnumbered without FTR, they end up losing the match with Hangman taking the pin. The following week on Tag Team Appreciation Night, FTR aligned themselves with Tully Blanchard and they attack the Rock and Roll Express. This catches everyone off guard, including the Elite, who come out to console the Rock and Roll Express. And they're all left wondering why FTR did what they did, including Hangman Page. The following week, Hangman confronts FTR and asks them why they did what they did. FTR say they did this because the Rock and Roll Express gave them their back as they were talking, and they felt disrespected. FTR then tell Hangman that the number one contenders tag team gauntlet match, which is taking place next week on Dynamite, cannot be won by the Young Bucks because of the Young Bucks beat Hangman for the tag team titles, then he'll just go back to being in their shadow. A clearly conflicted Hangman reluctantly toasts with FTR. On the very same episode of Dynamite, the Young Bucks and Kenny Omega win a six-man tag against the Dark Order. And once again after the match, Kenny Omega seems to have snapped as he tries to powerbomb Ellen Angels onto a chair before the Young Bucks stop him. At this point, the Elite are just in complete shambles and it all leads to the breaking point the following week during the tag team gauntlet match for the number one contendership. The Bucks are in this match and they're dominating, they're about to eliminate the best friends, they're setting up for the Malter driver, Nick Jackson is on the apron, but before he can jump up, Hangman appears seemingly out of nowhere and holds him down. This allows Trent to roll up Matt Jackson to get the win and eliminate the Young Bucks. The Young Bucks are livid and Hangman looks distraught. The Bucks try to get an answer out of Hangman, but a broken Hangman just walks away. And as you can imagine, FTR end up winning the gauntlet match to become number one contender and the match is set. FTR versus Hangman and Omega for the tag team titles at All Out. Later in the night though, the Bucks find Hangman in the bar. After so many months of animosity and trying to make the friendship work, the Young Bucks just finally let it all out. They call Hangman insecure, they call him a drunk, they call him a jobber, and Matt Jackson even throws a drink into Hangman's face. The Young Bucks say they're tired of trying to make the friendship work and they give Hangman what he's wanted since November of 2019 they kick him out of the elite. The young bucks storm out and Hangman is left looking at the broken window on the door. A broken man looking at a broken window. And he's left all alone, not just by the Young Bucks, but by FTR too. An FTR who which Hangman was expecting as seen by the two drinks he had ready for them. And during all of this, no sign whatsoever of Kenny Omega. That is, until the next week during the Go Home episode of Dynamite for All Out 2020. An in-ring interview to get Kenny Omega's thoughts on the situation is interrupted by FTR. They come out praising Kenny, they tell him they have no problem with him, and they propose one more toast before their match at All Out. Kenny basically tells them to fuck off and tells them he doesn't want their toast and he tells him he wants to fight them two on one. Then Hangman Page makes his way out to the ring. He looks emotionally broken. He appears as if he's been drinking all day or crying all night or maybe even both. FTR then tell Hangman to tell Kenny who told him to turn on all of his friends. They say it wasn't FTR. They say Hangman did this to himself because he's an insecure little boy and always has been. This pisses Hangman off and he tries to fight FTR before Kenny stops him. Kenny tells Hangman that they're trying to get into his head like they did before. During all of this, FTR got a hold of the tag team titles and Hangman sees them and he asks for them back. But in an ultimate sign of disrespect, FTR just dropped them right in front of his face. Hangman picks up the titles and reaches behind his back to hand Kenny his belt. But when he turns around, he sees Omega standing outside of the ring just shaking his head. Hangman stands in the middle of the ring, no longer friends with FTR, 
or the Young Bucks, and now wondering if he's still even friends with his own tag team partner. FTR targeted and manipulated Hangman at a time where he was vulnerable and felt all alone. He felt he no longer fit in with the elite, but he felt at home with FTR. But this was FTR's plan since the very beginning. They knew that as long as the elite were a thing, they would not be able to win the AEW tag team titles. So what they did is they broke up the elite from within and they chose the most vulnerable guy in the group to do it. FTR left Hangman a broken man and Kenny Omega a ticking time bomb before their match at All Out. Hangman Page and Kenny Omega would make their entrances at the pay-per-view without even acknowledging each other. Meanwhile, FTR's confidence is at an all-time high. Hangman and Omega don't acknowledge each other until the bell rings and it's when Hangman tells Kenny that he wants to be the one who starts the match. Kenny allows Hangman to start the match but he just tells him to keep his head in check. FTR try to play mind games early on with Hangman like offering him a handshake but he rejects it. At this point, Hangman just wants to prove that he's still a good tag team partner because as far as he knows, Kenny is his only friend left. There's a spot early on in the match where Kenny and Hangman are double teaming Cash Wheeler with a few chops. This gets a smile out of Hangman who then signals to Kenny for a high 10. Kenny looks at Hangman a little bit hesitant but he does eventually give Hangman the high 10. I absolutely love this spot because it's a callback to one of the very first times that Hangman and Omega teamed up in AEW. Omega signaled to Hangman for a high 10 but Hangman rejected Omega. And this tugs on your heartstrings because it's Hangman trying his hardest to make it work. He wants to go back to those days when the elite were his friends. In Hangman's mind, if he and Omega get through this one, then they're gonna be okay. And Hangman is absolutely trying his hardest in this match. He's saving Kenny from attacks, saving him from pins. He's checking up on him on the outside to make sure he's okay. And it's not like Kenny isn't trying either. Sure, he starts the match a little bit weary of Hangman, but as the match goes on, he and Hangman start to click as they always do. Things actually seem to be going well a little too well and it's just an emotional roller coaster of a match but FTR aren't holding back either of course they're wrestling their style where they target a body part and this is where we get the heat of the match where Kenny Omega misses a V trigger on the turnbuckle and from there on out they attack Kenny's knee it essentially leaves Kenny wrestling on one leg Kenny does eventually get the hot tag though and Hangman comes in to clean house. He dominates. And after a bit, Hangman does call to Omega to hit their tag team finisher the last call. Cash Wheeler dodges the initial try but then Hangman gets a hold of him and Kenny Omega goes for the V trigger but Wheeler moves out of the way and Kenny ends up hitting Hangman instead. Omega is left stunned and Wheeler immediately capitalizes and targets the knee of Omega. Omega falls to the floor and he reaches and he claws for Hangman after realizing what he's done. This is an absolute gut punch after seeing how well Kenny and Hangman were doing up to this point. FTR hit Hangman with a mindbreaker and at this point Kenny can't do much because of all the damage to his knee. He can't even stand and he's forced to watch as his partner is beaten. But to FTR shock, Hangman ends up kicking out of the Mindbreaker. This is Hangman showing heart. This is him giving everything he has left. He doesn't want to lose this. He doesn't want to lose his only friend. FTR once more take out Omega and they hit one more Mindbreaker on Hangman Adam Page and they get the win. The 228 day reign of Kenny Omega and Hangman Adam Page comes to an end at the hands of FTR. Dax Harwood and Cash Wheeler celebrate their tag team title win and in a final act of disrespect, they leave their beers next to a defeated Hangman. In upset, Kenny Omega runs off FTR with a weapon in hand. And it's here where Kenny Omega seems like he's about to snap on his partner Hangman Page. As Hangman is struggling to get on his feet, Kenny Omega is in the background looking like he's ready to attack. But when Hangman finally gets to his feet, Kenny tosses the weapon aside. Hangman walks to Kenny for support, for consolation. But instead of helping his partner, instead of supporting him, instead of catching him, Kenny just allows Hangman to collapse to the floor. The last person Hangman was able to turn to just left him to die. Omega with seemingly no remorse or sympathy kicks the beers that FTR left in the ring and leaves Hangman laying there all alone. In a way this is worse than if Kenny were to have attacked Hangman because by just leaving him laying there, 
He's saying, you're not worth it anymore. You're nothing to me. And he storms out of the arena. He sees the Young Bucks and he tells them he's done with everything. It's time for a clean break. And he tells them to think about if they want to join him. As he gets in a car that drives off. The story of Hangman Page is a tragic one. It's heartbreaking. Since the formation of AEW, he was always the odd man out of the elite. And that's why he wanted to step away from the group and do his own thing. But in an ironic twist of fate, he found success teaming up with a member of the elite but he was never truly happy. Hangman Page has simply not been the same man since he lost the world title match against Chris Jericho at All Out 2019. That loss ended up getting so badly into his head that it turned into losing one match into losing everything just one year later. But Hangman is so beloved because we all relate to him. We've all been in his shoes. He might be the most realistic character in professional wrestling today. And that's just due to the perfect, beautiful, long-term storytelling being done by AEW. And this feels like we're only just getting started even if the story has been going on for over a year up to this point. The match at All Out was heartbreaking because we saw the character of Hangman trying his best giving it his all, trying to hang on to the only thing he had left. He knew he had messed up, but despite giving it his all, it still wasn't enough. And now he finds himself at rock bottom and having to work his way back up. When Kenny Omega became a free agent in February 2019, any company that picked him up would have benefited greatly. As stated before, he had come off a hugely successful run in New Japan Pro Wrestling. And it was this run that helped him build a following amongst hardcore wrestling fans. But after the announcement of All Elite Wrestling, everybody felt it was inevitable that he'd sign with the promotion along with his friends. The recruitment of Kenny Omega by AEW would not take long as it was announced in early February that he had signed with the promotion. This announcement came during an AEW press conference in Las Vegas for their upcoming show, Double or Nothing. Omega himself would show up at the press conference to huge fanfare. This was a huge deal and it was because it was a huge get for AEW. It felt like when a sports team signs a big star player. The crowd's reaction said it all. Kenny Omega was destined to be their top guy. Now Kenny Omega came in to AEW as the best wrestler in the world. But it would also be announced that besides being just an on-screen talent, he would also be an executive vice president of the entire promotion. A title also held by his fellow stablemates, the Young Bucks and Cody Rhodes, leaving many wondering how this would affect his role as an on-screen talent. But any concerns that people had were quickly undone when it was announced that Kenny Omega would be wrestling against Chris Jericho in the main event of the first ever AEW show, Double or Nothing. This would serve as a re match from Wrestle Kingdom 12 where the two of these competitors met in a match where Kenny Omega ultimately came out victorious. But this time, this match would be on a different stage. It would be in AEW, the biggest alternative to WWE since WCW, meaning there would be way more eyes on this match than the first time around and it would be the perfect platform for Kenny Omega to introduce himself to a much larger audience and prove why he was being lauded as the best wrestler in the world. And as if this match wasn't already huge enough, it would be announced that whoever came out victorious would be a participant in the match that would crown the first ever AEW World Champion. So the stakes for this match were insanely high, but these are the types of matches where Kenny Omega thrived in. He had gained a reputation in Japan to deliver when the pressure was on. So this was nothing new for Omega. If anything, this would be his crowning moment, his big moment in America, to prove why he earned earned the moniker the best bout machine. Becoming the ace of AEW was his destiny, and the fans knew it as well. So what happened? AEW decided to take a creative risk by subverting their audience's expectations. Let me explain. 
The Kenny Omega that went into Double or Nothing was a different Kenny Omega than the one from New Japan Pro Wrestling. The Kenny Omega that came into AEW had the weight of the world on his shoulders. The world already knew what he was capable of. He came in a made man compared to New Japan Kenny, who we went on a whole journey with. We grew with him, we suffered with him, we saw him finally conquer the top of the mountain by seeing him become the world heavyweight champion. So now it was a matter of becoming the top guy in AEW. So when Kenny Omega made his entrance into the MGM Grand Garden Arena for his match against Chris Jericho, the rabid AEW fanbase gave him a hero's welcome. It was almost like Kenny Omega had home field advantage. It felt like the perfect place and the perfect time but it ended up being anything but. Kenny Omega would lose his AEW debut match against Chris Jericho. In the biggest moment of his career, he came up short. And it's not like Omega couldn't beat Jericho. He had already done that a year prior. Something was just missing that night. And while it was a huge loss in front of a large audience, maybe it was just a bad night for Omega. After the match, a debuting John Moxley would make his way to the ring and attack both Jericho and Kenny Omega. Once the show came to an end, it became abundantly clear that a matchup between Jon Moxley and Kenny Omega was coming. A big match, an ideal match for Kenny Omega to take to get back to winning ways. Before his big matchup with Jon Moxley at All Out 2019, Kenny Omega would pick up two wins in the lead up to the show. His first win came at Fighter Fest where he teamed up with the Young Bucks to defeat the Lucha Bros and Loretto Kid. Next, he would pick up a win against Shima at Fight for the Fallen. So two wins against respectable opponents, but obviously none on the level of his super fight with Jon Moxley. But that match wouldn't end up happening at All Out. Moxley would end up pulling out of the match after an injury to his elbow that required surgery would leave him unable to compete. This left Omega without an opponent for All Out but AEW found a last minute replacement. They would announce that Pac would be making his AEW debut replacing Jon Moxley to face Kenny Omega. This was a suitable replacement, as anybody who knows Pac knows he's one of the best wrestlers in the world. But with him stepping up with nine days notice, Kenny Omega was still heavily favored to be the winner. But once again, Kenny Omega was beaten in his second big one-on-one -on -one match on pay-per-view for AEW, and the crowd was stunned. This loss was far more shocking than Kenny's first one back at Double or Nothing against Chris Jericho. Because now we're left wondering what's going on with Kenny Omega? Why isn't he winning? He's supposed to be the ace of this company and now we've seen him take two big losses on pay-per-view. It was no secret, this match was must win for Kenny Omega. To the point where even JR on commentary asked a question during Omega's entrance for this match. He asked, did Kenny Omega leave his wrestling heart in Japan? And all things considered, it was a valid question. Was Kenny Omega losing because his heart was still in Japan? Or could it also be that the American stage was too big for him? Many questions were being asked after this loss to Pac, and it seemed to have gotten to Omega as on being the elite, he was starting to act strange and almost unhinged. It got to the point where the Young Bucks got really worried about him and had to talk him in to showing up for the premiere episode of AEW Dynamite. And Kenny would end up showing up for this show and he would participate in the main event where he teamed up with the Young Bucks to face Jericho and Santana in Ortiz. Kenny seemed to be in a better place mentally. He was on a roll in this match, that is, until Jon Moxley interfered and attacked him from behind. The two would brawl all over the arena and it would end with the now iconic paradigm shift through the glass table to Omega. Later, it would be announced that Omega and Moxley would finally have their match at full gear in an unsanctioned match. And the pressure couldn't be bigger for Kenny Omega. This match was must win even more than any other match he'd ever been in. Because as stated before, this was a made Kenny Omega. This was no longer underdog Kenny Omega. And Omega himself would say this. He said he didn't want to lose to a guy like John Moxley considering where he came from. Kenny was not holding back in the lead up to this match. He was making it known that he was more ready than ever. 
and that he'd be able to beat Moxley at his own game. This had the feel of a super fight, and it seemed as if Omega was finally ready to get his first big win in AEW. But for the third consecutive time in a big match, Kenny Omega couldn't get the job done. John Moxley would defeat Kenny Omega at full gear, and it feels like this is the match that finally broke Kenny. Over the next few weeks, it appeared as if Omega was obsessing over the fact that he had lost to Moxley. He would talk about how he felt he could defeat defeat Moxley if they were to have another match. And just as it seemed that Kenny Omega was reaching his breaking point, he found something that made him feel like a winner again. He found success teaming with his fellow elite stable member Hangman Adam Page. The duo helped each other get back to winning ways almost instantly. It was almost too good to be true. But still, it wasn't clear whether Kenny was in this team for the long run or if he was just using it as a distraction. Omega and Hangman would exceed all expectations as a tag team and they would even become tag team champions in this stacked tag team division. And this was all despite Hangman and Omega's complicated relationship not just as a tag team but as friends. These two were dominating a division while going through their own problems both internally and with each other. And the funny thing is, Kenny Omega started off as the one who was really invested in this tag team. He really wanted to make it work. But over time, he just grew tired with all his problems with Hangman Page. Meanwhile, Hangman was the opposite. He didn't want to be a part of this tag team in the beginning, but as time went on, he realized all the mistakes he was making. And at the end, the tag team was the only thing he had left and he wanted to make it work. But by the time Hangman realized this, it was already too late for Kenny Omega. He was too far gone at this point. When Hangman and Omega lost the tag team titles after hanging on to them for almost 8 months, that's when Omega realized that he was done with Hangman and that he didn't need him anymore. Which is why he left a defeated Hangman who was looking to him for support just laying in the middle of the ring after they lost their titles. The story between these two is incredible and if you want the full week by week breakdown I have two videos and I'll leave the links to them in the description below. On the following episode of Dynamite, Kenny Omega would have a sit down interview with Jim Ross and he would say that he was done with tag team wrestling. He reassured that he enjoyed teaming with Hangman even though they sometimes didn't see eye to eye but since they were no longer champions, that he wanted to move on and move into the singles division once again. And also, for the first time, Kenny would admit in the sit-down interview that he wanted to be the ace of AEW and that he knew that this is what the fans wanted since the beginning. Omega would also admit that the primary reason he moved into the tag team division was because he was directionless after his loss to Jon Moxley. But after spending nearly a year in the tag team division, Omega was now ready to become the ace of All Elite Wrestling. And Omega would get his wish because it would be announced that he would be participating in a tournament that would determine the number one contender for the AEW World Championship. And if you know Kenny Omega's history, you know he specializes in tournaments. There's a saying that goes, absence makes the heart grow fonder. The more you're kept apart from something, the more you'll miss it, the more you'll want to see it. And that's the route AEW decided to go when telling the story of Kenny Omega. Instead of instantly making Kenny the top guy in AEW, they made you wait for it. They made you want it. Just like New Japan did. Only this time it's different. In New Japan, it was the chase to become the ace. In AEW, it's the chase to once again become the ace. By making the fans wait for Kenny to become the world champion, AEW added so many more layers to his character that wouldn't have been there and he just won the title right out the gate. This was a calculated move by Kenny Omega and all the higher ups in AEW to give others a time to shine and make you want Kenny to be the top guy even more than you originally did. But they did it in a way that was clever. It's not like they just had him in the sidelines waiting to get his turn. They had him crafting one of the most interesting stories in wrestling in years with Hangman Page. And as a result, when Kenny finally does become the top guy, he'll have a white hot feud with Hangman waiting for him. But before he gets there, Omega has one fight he has to get to first. And it's against the guy that beat him 
and sent his character into complete disarray. The man who started all of this, John Moxley. Omega vs Moxley is the big money match that everybody's waiting for. And this time, it'll be for the title and it'll be in Omega who's more serious than ever. One who's showing signs of the cleaner. It's a journey that's taken over a year to get to, but I feel like Omega becoming the champion is almost here. And when it finally happens, it'll be special and worth the wait. Because make no mistake about it, this calculated long-term storyline was the plan all along. Over a year ago, Kenny Omega warned us, he's just getting started. So we last left off with the calculated arc of Kenny Omega. This was before he even became AEW World Champion. I've covered Kenny Omega's matches as champion in multiple videos throughout his reign, but for journalistic integrity's sake, I'll quickly recap Omega's arc as champion. Kenny Omega abandoned Hangman after losing the tag titles to FTR and even defeated Hangman in the World Title Eliminator Tournament Final to become number one contender. Of course, he would defeat Moxley at Winter is Coming, turning heel in the process and kickstart a dominant reign. Omega is the longest reigning world champion in AEW history. As an in-ring worker, he adapted to his opponent's style. With six successful defenses, Omega cemented his spot as the ultimate final boss in AEW, though his matches always came with help from the Elite and Don Callis. Meanwhile, Hangman Page was left without any support, without any friends, after Omega abandoned him. If you recall in the second video of this series, Hangman tried to right his wrongs with the Elite when it was far too late. Kenny and the Bucks had reached the point of no return, they walked down a dark path that they're still on to this day. But Hangman found allies in an unlikely place. If you recall, back in late 2019, early 2020, when Hangman was feeling lost, the Brody Lee-led Dark Order was trying to recruit him, but Hangman blew them off, citing not wanting to join a cult as a reason. But despite Hangman's best efforts to not be a part of a group again after his experience with the Elite and FTR, he couldn't stay away from the Dark Order no matter how how hard he tried. They stood and fought together directly after the passing of Brody Lee, which formed a bond between both sides. Although the Dark Order would continue to ask Hangman to become an official member, he decided that fighting alongside them meant more than being labeled an official member. When Hangman was beefing with the 500,000 members of the Hardy family office, the Dark Order was there to save him at every turn. On being the elite, Hangman and the Dark Order became the big odd happy family. In the build to Double or Nothing 2021, Hangman was at the top spot in the rankings, which made a clash with Omega inevitable. However, Hangman would suffer a shock defeat to Brian Cage on an episode of Dynamite which would see him fall down the rankings. It was here where Hangman entered a short feud with Team Taz, where he again had support from the Dark Order to even the odds. Page would open up the first pay-per-view with a full crowd in over a year when he defeated Brian Cage, avenging his loss from a few weeks earlier. After Double or Nothing, Hangman saw himself climb his way up the rankings once more, but this time, it was for real. But that's not how Hangman saw it. Despite sitting in the number one spot, Hangman was actively avoiding Kenny Omega, even abstaining from saying his name. Adam Page was still full of self-doubt, scared of failing, scared of disappointing friends once again. But the Dark Order gave him what no one else had in AEW so far support. The Dark Order had experienced very real heartbreak themselves when they lost Brody Lee. After Brody's passing, we saw them embracing friendship, embracing Hangman. These two sides found each other when they needed it most, and that's why Dark Order pushed for Adam to no longer be afraid to no longer doubt himself. They pushed Paige to confront Kenny Omega, and because for the first time in his AEW career, he had belief from friends, Hangman began to believe just a little in himself. So when Omega and Hangman came face to face for the first time in eight months at Road Rager, Hangman went in full of confidence and Omega was now the one with doubt. However, since Omega was the champion, he still had all the leverage in the world. He used this to his advantage and told Hangman that if he wants his title shot, he and the Dark Order would need to defeat Omega and the Elite in a 5v5 elimination tag match. The catch being that if Hangman and Dark Order lost, he would have to relinquish his shot at the world title along with the Dark Order with their tag title shot. The fight was on. This time, Hangman had people fighting not for him, but alongside him. 
him, and it led to one of the best entrances in AEW history when Hangman Adam Page and the Dark Order made their way to the ring as a collective unit at Fight for the Fallen. For the first time, Hangman belonged and he felt like the biggest thing in AEW because of it. However, this moment of pure bliss would be short-lived as Page and the Dark Order would end up falling short, relinquishing their title shots in the process. Not only was Hangman defeated, but so was the crowd. Hangman lasted until the very end, but he was outnumbered by Kenny Omega and Nick Jackson and their underhanded tactics. He went down fighting. This was a gut punch. It was supposed to be Hangman's moment, but the Elite took it away from Hangman, from the Dark Order, from all of us. This hit Adam Page harder than anyone else though. He felt responsible for the loss, for costing himself and his new friends a shot at gold in AEW. Therefore, he chose to split away from them and face the Elite on his own. The big difference here was, the Dark Order was actually respecting Hangman's wishes, a completely different response from them compared to the Elite when Hangman chose to leave them. The week after Fight for the Fallen, Hangman would be interrupted during an in-ring interview by the Elite. Omega called Page a loser and told Hangman that he's not on the level of the Elite. A brawl ensued, but Hangman was outnumbered. Members of the Dark Order came out of the tunnel before they were stopped by Evil Uno who demanded that they respected Hangman's wishes and not get involved any longer. A BTE trigger on Hangman would end the segment and it would write him off TV for the next couple of months as Paige and his wife were expecting the birth of their child very soon. For two months, the protagonist of AEW went missing, all while the promotion was exploding in popularity with the arrivals of top tier talent like CM Punk, Brian Danielson, and Adam Cole. And while all of that was insanely cool, we all knew that there was only one man who was ever going to beat Omega for the title. It was announced that a casino ladder match to earn a shot at the AEW world title would take place on the Dynamite second anniversary show. And that meant a joker would be involved. The match was stacked with talent. Moxley, Pac, Andrade, Archer, Orange Cassidy, and Matt Hardy for some reason, but it was the Joker who stole the headlines. Hangman Adam Page made his long-awaited return and came back ready to conquer his demons. After some insane ass-kicking from our favorite anxious millennial cowboy, he climbed the ladder and won the match. The redemption arc officially kicked into full gear. The match was set. Kenny Omega vs Hangman Page for the AEW world title at full gear, a match years in the making. The following week, Hangman would speak to us from the heart. He talked about how he came into AEW wanting to be the first ever AEW world champion and how he failed. He talked about how losing his friends made him lose himself, but the support of true friends helped him get back on his feet. Hangman mentioned that the only thing he never lost was the support of the crowd. The cowboy shit chants grew louder every week, and he mentioned that that when they were at their absolute loudest, he had the balls to step away to be there for the birth of his son. That's cowboy shit. Hangman had a new perspective this time around. He thanked the crowd for always believing in him because for the first time, he now believes in himself too. He didn't promise a win at full gear, but he did promise that we would get cowboy shit. An excellent babyface promo that made us feel validated for cheering on Hangman for the past two and a half years. A story of fan support actually leading to the the development of a character shouldn't be a novel concept, but in modern American wrestling, it is. Hangman had found the one thing he was lacking his entire AEW run, self-belief, and he found it after finding friends, after the continued support from the audience, and after the birth of his son. A character doesn't get more human than this in pro wrestling. Meanwhile, the Elite and Kenny Omega didn't seem to take Hangman seriously. Omega would cut a promo basically disregarding Hangman as he always had. But what the Elite and Omega didn't expect was for Adam Page to crash their Halloween themed match against Hangman's friends, the Dark Order. The Elite were having a little too much fun beating down the Dark Order, but they didn't even notice Hangman had taken Cutler's spot as the Stay Puffed Marshmallow Man. Page would attack Matt Jackson and help Dark Order get the big win to close out the show. A message was sent. The following week, Omega would face Ellen Angels of the Dark Order. After picking up the win, Omega would continue to attack Angels until Hangman made the save 
Gabe nearly hitting Omega with the Bugshot Lariat. Paige would pick up the AEW World title left in the ring and tell Omega that he has 10 days left. Hangman was finally confident enough to not only face Omega, but to play some mind games like him as well. This all led to our final stop before full gear, the contract signing. Kenny Omega continued to play mind games with Paige. He brought up their time together and said Hangman could have been on Kenny's level if it weren't for his insecurities. Hangman responded by calling out Omega's insecurities when it came to the Golden Lovers. Hangman made it clear he was no longer afraid or full of doubt, and Omega was going to face a fully confident Hangman this time around as opposed to their match at Full Gear one year ago. Omega told Hangman he misunderstood and conned Paige into shaking his hand one last time before Don Callis, who was posing as a cameraman, attacked Paige and left him bloodied. Omega would sign the contract with Hangman's blood adding insult to injury. Oh, and one more thing. On the rampage the night before Full Gear, Hangman apologized to the Young Bucks. He said they were even, considering they both cost each other a title shot. Hangman did warn the Bucks to not get involved in his title match against Kenny or otherwise he would ruin them, obviously planting seeds for the future. Hangman made his entrance at Full Gear after a sick pre-recorded video and got the heroes welcome. Omega came out with the one winged angel gear. This instantly had the big fight feel. There was chops to start the match, Hangman is actually confident, and then we have Don Callis getting involved early on. Omega is distracting the referee a lot so Callis can take advantage of the situation. After a while, Omega starts to get cocky and he starts dominating. He hits a sunset flip powerbomb, a snapdragon suplex on the apron. Hangman responds by hitting an avalanche blockbuster and a dive off the turnbuckle to the outside through the ring announcer table. Hangman tries for the buckshot, but Omega drops, so Hangman decides to go for a V-trigger instead. Omega gets up, Hangman reads this, and then he hits a sick combo. He sets up once more for the buckshot, but Omega ends up shielding himself with the ref, and Hangman hits him instead. So now there's no ref, and we're getting all these crazy shenanigans. Don Callis and Omega try to hit Hangman with the belt, but Hangman evades, and he hits a dead eye on Omega, and he goes for the pin. That's when Aubrey Edwards comes out running and counts a crazy near fall. Paige and Omega go back and forth until Omega hits him with multiple knee strikes and then a V trigger. Omega is frustrated and kicking Hangman but Hangman does not give up and he hits a lariat. Both men are down and there's loud AEW chants. Young Bucks come down to the ring. Hangman goes for a buckshot but Omega hits a V trigger. He tries the one winged angel but Hangman counters and hits a one winged angel of his own. But of course Omega kicks out. Hangman hits the apron and he makes eye contact with the Young Bucks. He hits Omega with a buckshot lariat from behind. Paige goes out to the apron again and makes eye contact with Matt Jackson, who then nods at Hangman in approval. Hangman hits a clean buckshot lariat on Omega and gets the win. All of his demons conquered, all of his insecurities no longer holding him down. And in an ironic twist of fate with the Young Bucks in his corner, the same Young Bucks who were at ringside for all of Kenny's matches, but who refused to be there for Hangman's match against Jericho at All Out 2019 for the AEW World title. We came full circle. And before the show ended, Hangman's friends, the Dark Order, walked out to celebrate with him. The same friends who helped him conquer all his demons, the same friends who let him get to this moment. He was offered a beer by them, but he didn't even want that. He chose to hug them before they lifted him on their shoulders in a beautiful image to end the show. This is how you pay off a story with a satisfying ending. On day one, Adam Page came into AEW and said he wanted to be the first ever AEW World Champion, but he failed. And when he failed, he lost everything. He had to work his way up back from the bottom, and we were all there to cheer him on during his rise up to the top again. We love the anxious millennial cowboy because he's relatable, he has insecurities, he has faults, and he's not afraid to admit that he does. And it's okay that he has his faults because he can work through them because he has friends who helped him get through it. After those two years of self-doubt, self-loathing, Hangman finally became what he wanted to be, the AEW World Champion. And he did it by defeating the man who will always be a associated with his career. Kenny Omega, the big final boss of AEW. The two friends who didn't want it to lead to this, but they both knew it had to lead to this because both men wanted to be at the top of the mountain. Hangman was lost when he left the elite, but he knew it was a decision he had to make because he wasn't happy there. And while in the short term it seemed like it affected him negatively, the choice ended up being the correct one because now he's at the top of AEW. He's the champion. He's the guy.
die. And with that, this multi-year-long story has come to an end. Whether Hangman and the other members of the elite can ever be friends again remains to be seen, but they do say that time heals all wounds. Maybe the Young Bucks gave them that nod of approval for a reason because they knew this was inevitable. They knew AEW is Hangman's story. This is his story and he's the protagonist. The era of larger than life characters worked because it was a product of its time. In this day and age, we need something to relate to. We need something to sink our teeth into. And that's why everybody loves Hangman Adam Page because we can all relate to him. A win for him was a win for everybody because we had the time to grow with Hangman as a character for over two two years. We got to know him, we got to relate to him, we got the chance to care for him. This is the end of one of the best long-term arcs in professional wrestling history. From the beginning where Hangman bit off more than he could chew and he fell to rock bottom, to the middle where Hangman was lost and trying to find his way, trying to find friends, and finally finding the right friends, to the triumphant end where he finally overcame all his obstacles, where he finally met his day one goal of becoming AEW World Champion. A clear beginning, middle, and end of a character arc. That's character development. And this, my friends, has been the Hangman Adam Page Saga.